What's up, everyone? Welcome to Unmasked, where things are discovered, uncovered, brought to the light, and made known. I'm your host, Lamar Barry, coming live to you from PG County, Maryland. If you're interested in finding out about the untold stories behind being a college coach, this is the show for you. Being a former assistant men's college basketball coach for 16 years, there are so many untold stories behind the scenes in the life of a college basketball coach. Now, let's unmask them. Today's guest is a longtime assistant coach, friend, roommate, and a Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, uh, Phil Martelli Jr. And yes, you heard me right. I said roommate. We actually, my first year of college coaching, Phil's first year of college coaching, um, we actually uh, lived together for a year before I ended up getting married. It was the, uh, I moved to Connecticut, Phil moved to Connecticut. We're at Central Connecticut State University. We actually had met for the first time that summer uh, at Eastern Invitational, which is now the Hoop Group. And he was like, hey, I'm, I'm going to Central Connecticut State too. And we, we both were supposed to have been keeping secrets, but we, we kind of knew that both of us was going. So, you know, we, we talked it out and we ended up, you know, roomed together for a year and, and they just um, built the bond, not only working with him for two years, but living with him. And then also, like, we've just been friends. I've been, I was at his wedding. So I remember when he first uh, met his wife, Megan. So I, I've kind of been through it all with Phil. But I, I want to say a few things about Phil before I bring him on. And, like, Phil played for his dad. Phil knew early on that he wanted to be a coach. And he went to St. Joe's and played for his dad, Phil Martelli. Um, at St. Joe's, who did an awesome job for the long time he was at St. Joe's. And then, like, Phil, right after um, he um, finished that St. Joe's plan, he went, came right to Central Connecticut State University. We spent two years there at Connecticut State, and from there, Phil moved on to Manhattan for one year with uh, with Gonzo, uh, with, with Gonzalez, um, and then and Bobby Gonzalez, and then he moved on to Niagara, where he was with Joe Mahalik, which – Another common story, he worked for Joe Mahalik for five seasons. I worked for him for three seasons. So another common story we have in, 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 um, in Bond and then Delaware for five years. But those guys did a terrific job and ended up going to the NCAA tournament while he was there, um, you know, both at Niagara and at Delaware. And then from there, he coached one year in the G League with the uh, uh, Delaware 87ers, which is now the Del Delaware Blue Coats. Uh, and then he went to work with his dad for a year at St. Joe's as the director of programming uh, administration. And then now he's currently at Bryant University up in Rhode Island, where he spent the last couple of years with Jerry Grasso. So I want to say all of that and say welcome to the show, Phil. Thanks, Lamar. I appreciate you having me. We, we have certainly come a long way from, uh, what was it called? The Town Ridge Townhouses or something like that in Middletown, Connecticut. Uh, you know, a lot of a lot of nights there, kind of just us chopping it up, talking, just probably doing the same thing we're doing right now, except uh, face to face. It's funny. We were I was just talking about this. Uh, we had driven to my in-laws in Connecticut, who Lamar knows that I met my wife while I was at Central. And the week that I met her, she had come to work our camp. And that week is the week I was moving out, that I was moving to New Britain with a football guy and a strength guy into a house because you were getting ready to get married and kicked me out. and. You know, I, I know I know you haven't told Sandy this, and hopefully she won't watch this, but you have told me that, including her, I'm the best roommate you ever had, so. No question, Phil, no question. <laughs> well, look, man, thanks for coming, and uh, you know what? Let's go ahead and get um, unmasked, man. Um, first thing I like to ask my guests is, like, you know, we all know we get it. We, we sign up for this business, and, you know, we find out what it is, but you never know, like, you you know what you want to do, but you don't know what you're doing when you get there. So there's no handbook to being a college coach. And, you know, I think it's us and maybe a car salesman that just thrown into the fire right away, figure out what you do. And, you know, like no one tells you that. So tell me about your first day, first week, first month after things are done with human resources and going through orientation, like, especially when no one gives you direction. Now you kind of had, uh, a little guidance with your, you know, with your dad being a coach and you learning, not just playing for him, but like learning how to coach and learning the business as well. But tell me about that. Tell me about that experience. It's a great point. There really is no handbook. And one of the things, obviously, I was fortunate to grow up in it, like you just said, and grow up around it. But I grew up around it in a way that I was a family member. I was a player. And my dad had his way of doing things. 
So just for example, when we, you know, that first week when we got the central and you get in the office, you do all those paperwork things, you do the, the human resources stuff, you do all that. And then you don't, you really don't know what to do. And for us, you know, Chris Casey was, was there and established there. Anthony Latina was there and established there. But me and you were walking in there. We didn't know. You were coming from high school. I was coming from, from being in school. And for me, one of the things that I always say as a young guy, I think not even so much my assumption, but other people's assumptions were, oh, you've been around it, so you know what to do. I knew how to work hard. And I knew what it took, but I didn't know on a daily basis on Tuesday at 1030, like I didn't know really what was going on, you know, in September at, on, on, you know, September 18th at 1030 AM. Like, I didn't know. I mean, I remember sitting there some days going like, I have nothing to do and I don't know what to even start to do or who to ask. And, you know, you, you end up, through the process, figuring things out and finding your niche and, and doing different things. But, and, and every place I've been now, you know, central Manhattan, Niagara, Delaware, in the D leg, uh, St. Joe's to Bryant was all very, very different. Those first weeks, first months, first, whatever, because you're always coming into a different dynamic, you know, coming up until I came to Bryant, I had never been somewhere where it wasn't established where I was sliding into a, a, a spot that was already pretty established. Head coach had been there. At least most of the assistants had been there. We come to Bryant and your first week is like, I mean, I'm going up in a suit and tie, going to human resources to do my stuff, coming back and walking on the court and they're finishing up a workout and you're being interested. And then 12 hours later, you're in the gym with guys like, you know, back in the gym and or in the weight room or whatever. And you're, and you're their coach now. Um, and for us at that time, trying to figure out brand new program, brand new head coach, trying to come in, figure out the ways of Bryant, you know, the processes of Bryant and, what, you know, the ways to navigate that. And also what we're trying to do and establish as the program. Uh, so it is, it's, it's very different for everybody in every situation. Um, this is interesting because we know that recruiting is a lifeline, man, college basketball or athletics in general but like say like greatest like what what the worst recruit story best and worst someone's I mean, I, I think I don't know if I have like one specific worst recruiting story. I mean I have a couple like um and I'm drawing a blank on the kid's name, but there was a kid in Jersey that I was recruiting that I had driven down from Niagara, drove down and back. It was like seven hours each way. So drove 14 hours basically to go see his state playoff game. And I walk in the gym and um, uh, one of the Dunn brothers was at Michigan at that time with John Beeline. And he's sitting in the gym and I'm like, oh my God, like we're done. Like I just drove, I'm gonna drive 14, 15 hours today and it's over. So to me, it's more general, like how many of those situations, the number of kids that I chased around Orlando or Vegas and, you know, bumped the flight back. And like, I could go through that list of names, the Sammy Givens who ends up, you know, at Drexel, the, the Donovan Jack who ends up at Penn State, guys that you're like spent all this time recruiting, recruiting, recruiting till the very end of July. And then all of a sudden, you know, somebody jumps in, somebody walks in the door and you go, it's over. Yeah, I can remember Darren Hilliard sitting there watching him in, in Orlando and Jay Wright was with something with USA Basketball and Mitch Bonagoro, who was at Siena, and it was kind of us and them recruiting the kid for the most part. And he leaned over to me, he goes, you know, Jay's coming in to see him tomorrow, right? And I was like, huh? And, you know, you just know at that point in time, like all the, all the stuff you've done is over. Like it's just, it's gone. Uh, so to me, it's more those. Like I think more back, back more on those times. And the flip side is, and me and Jared talk about this all the time, the best players I've recruited have been the easiest to recruit. You know, people would know, like Wanye Green and Amin Tanksley were two tremendous players, first at Niagara and then at, uh, at Hofstra. Their recruitment was so easy. It was so easy. And, and I can remember my dad saying to me, you know, because Wanye was getting recruited pretty high. And I'd been recruiting Amin for a while and, and actually had, 
the first he went to Imhotep in Philadelphia. The first guy ever to, to go Division One out of the Imhotep was Kashif Edwards, who I got at Niagara. So you know I'm recruiting to me, and then all of a sudden somebody tells I think my my dad tells me like yeah Wanya's out for the summer. So I just picked up the phone and called him kind of randomly because I was like, well, maybe people forget about the kid. And then we hired Kyle Neptune from Villanova and his connection, uh, you know, with Lonnie Lowry and, and Kyle Lowry and all that kind of put it over the top. Those kids visited and committed within two or three days and visited nowhere else, you know? So how many of those stories that we have of guys that were like, it just was easy. They committed on a visit. They committed without a visit. I mean, me and Jared talk about that on end about, you know, those stories that, as opposed to the guys that you've chased and chased and chased and spent way too much money changing flights, canceling flights. All right, they won again. I've got to push my flight back. You know, I missed Pat Carroll, one of my favorite teammates of all time at St. Joe's. I missed his wedding because I was chasing somebody in Orlando. I don't even remember who I was chasing and didn't get, you know, but was supposed to be at his wedding and said, right, I got to stay in one more day. And, and you don't get him. Yeah, it's just a ton of those stories, man. Like, that's what people don't realize, especially, like, when you know you, you know, like, the kid is about to make his decision, and you like, man, I've done a call. Like, you feel – and you're devastated because you have put in a lot of work, a lot of time. And those are the toughest ones. Like you say, it's like – it's not a worse one, but they, they kind of – as they go. So I, I, sure. I feel you on those. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you like like you you like you um you you got married you know pretty young so you've um you know like you say you met your you what a couple of years out of uh college when you met your wife now and you guys started dating yeah, it was one, year. One, one year actually right it was like one year. One year. It was, yeah it was right after my first year uh at Central. <laughs> at Central. yeah so so now you've been in it for man it, it's you know we've seen seen long time ago man. 17 years like that's don't seem like it but like mm -hmm. what did you have to give up achieving your current level of success I mean there's a lot of family things it, it, more not necessarily my family like my wife and my kids um but being away you know having to leave Philadelphia like I grew up in Philadelphia my whole family was in Philadelphia so for me to graduate and say, yeah, I'm taking this job in New Britain, Connecticut, um, there was a lot to give up there. You know what I mean? Like friends and things like that. Like, like I'm not somebody that has like an extensive group of high school, college friends that, you know, I'm great with all those people, but like, I haven't seen them in ages, you know, and, and there's still a handful that I talk to, you know, periodically, but you know, those guys that get together on a Monday night to watch, you know, the Eagles, you know, it, it, you know, one of the guys we, we graduated high school with owns a bar in, in the city of Philadelphia. Like, they'll get together and watch, you know, I'll get, to, like, the Facebook thing, like, hey, we're meeting at such and such to watch the Eagles game. You know, and you'll see 8, 10, 15, 20 of them that are, you know, that are there. Like, I've never been able to do that. And that's okay. Like, I don't even – it's not even something that I sit here and envy. But uh, I think that – I mean, honestly, I think my, my wife and kids have had to give up more than I have, you know, which – which is unfair, I guess, but it's, it is part of this. And, you know, I'm lucky to, that they get it and, um, you know, that they love being a part of it. You know, me and my wife, we, we just celebrated our 12th anniversary last week. And we, we've been reminiscing a lot about those times. And she talks about that, about like when I left to go to Manhattan and the realization of like, she'd always been in Bristol, Connecticut, went to school in Connecticut, you know, went to college in Connecticut, the whole deal. And was like, oh my God, like I, she was like, I never thought I'd have to leave the state of Connecticut and had no desire to. And then all of a sudden I'm leaving and it's like, holy, you know, th if this is going to be our life, like this is real, you know, and three years later we're getting married and she's moving up to, you know, Lewiston, New York and, and, you know, right across the border from Canada. So, you know, she's had to give up way more than I have, to be honest with you. Sacrifice, man. So yeah. you, hey, you found a, you found a great one. And I mean, you, as you know, that was that's love at first sight. I always say that. I know it was, and, and <laughs> you got three beautiful kids out of it. So we do. Um, <laughs> Anthony Latina set that one up. Aunt, Aunt, get, Aunt gets the assist on that one. And trust me, he yeah. will tell you every time he sees you that he gets the assist on that one. No question, he does say that. Um, what was your best? Because we, well, this is what we know like you work for guys, and you know, some guys when you do a great scouting report and you still can lose the game or like 
you can do a bad scouting report. I'm going to say bad, but there's some stuff you left out, and you win by 20 or 30. Like, can you think of anything that was your – what was your best, worst scouting report? That's a really good question. Um, I'd have to say probably the best might have been William & Mary. Uh, you know, they had their unique style, kind of a Princeton-ish style. Uh, when I was at Delaware and we, we won, I want to say we won like 12 straight against them, including the championship game in 2014. I just had a comfort level of teaching that to our guys on sometimes on short preps. Uh, but just being able to present that in a way that they got it, that was simple, but they could understand it. Now, as you well know, like if we had lousy players, it wouldn't have mattered, but you know, they were good. We were good. And it was one of those places where, you know, we could, we could, um, we could just figure it out. Like we just had us, we had a way to play it. We kind of figured it out as the pieces came and went over the years, we still were able to kind of plug in, you know, this is how we're teaching it. This is how they're getting it. Um, another funny story with scouting, this is prior to you got there, but Hofstra used to send out their, their tapes and they had a microphone right near the bench. So you'd get all their play calls. I mean, it was, it was, it was hard to believe, to be honest with you. It was almost like you were being like pranked because you were like, wait a second, like I can hear everything that their bench is saying. Uh, and that changed when, when you guys got there, but uh, when Mahalik got there, he, he figured that one out pretty quick. Um, so those are some things that I remember. Um, you know, I, I think just in scouting in general, like, again, not to skip like a specific story, but just, uh, you know, certain times, things that you you see. I'll go back to William & Mary. William & Mary used to run a – Terry Tarpey, who was a real super athletic white kid from Fairfield, Connecticut, he used to steal the tip. He would try to steal the, the tip. And I didn't say anything to our guys about – it was one of those things you're like, there's 400 things I want to talk about. And that was somewhere on the list, and I didn't. And we're playing down there, and he stole the tip, goes in and dunks it. And I was beside myself. I was so mad at myself. And – now we ended up winning the game by like 50. I mean, we, we went all like Sadler and Usher went off if, after that. And it just, it was like not even a game. Um, but then we played them that year in the championship. I put that on the screen. That was the first thing on my scout tape to our guys with the headline that Martelli bleeped up, you know, and to let them know, like, this was on me, you know, like we should have talked about this. Now we know it. Um, another quick funny one was we lost my first year, at Delaware, we lost at Northeastern on a last second uh, sideline out of bounds. One of those games you, could, you couldn't you could lose. You're up seven with like 40 seconds to go with the ball. Uh, you need seven things out of seven to go wrong. And we had seven out of seven go wrong. And Joel Smith gets a three uh, sideline out of bounds. And our guys would still laugh about it today. I went through that play. I don't know if they ever ran that play ever again. But every time we play Northeastern, I would do that play. It would be the last thing we would do in the walkthrough. I'm like, we're walking through this again. We're walking through it again. We're walking through it again. And, and those, so those are kind of the scouting things that kind of stick in my mind. Awesome. Awesome. Um, and you, like I said, you've been in a long time. And, but, like, what's been your biggest challenge you have, you have experienced since you've, become, since you've been in college coaching? I mean, I think it's like all of us. Like, I mean, I have a goal, you know, and, and I want to be a head coach. And I mean, I'll be quite honest. Like if sitting in that, that townhouse in uh, Middletown, Connecticut, and, you know, sometime in 2004, you know, me and you, and we were talking and you said to me, yeah, 16 years from now, you're going to be back in the Northeast Conference as an assistant. I probably would have thought you were crazy, you know, and because you don't know what you don't know. Like you don't know – how hard that path is going to be and the twists and the turns that it's going to take you. You know, I saw it with people very close to me that, you know, at 25, 26 years old are, are big East assistants. And then the, the rug comes out from under you and then what, you know? So um, I think it's that, you know, and, and getting over the comparing yourself to others and comparing your, your path to somebody else's path. Cause it's also different, you know, cause you look at guys going like, Oh, he shot up the ranks. And you think like he's made it and then he hasn't, you know, and then you look at other guys that are like under the radar kind of floating around. No one even knows who they are. And then 
within, you know, four, five, six, seven years, they're at the top of the business. So, um, you know, I worked with a guy in the D league who he kind of put it best to me. He's like, we're in the lottery business. He goes, every day you wake up, like you're, you're just waiting for that lottery ticket, that lottery number to be called. And, you know, you work hard and you do what you got to do and, and you hope that it gets seen. But at the end of the day, there's a lot of guys that have worked really, really hard. that have done way better job than, than I've ever done that never got the chance, you know? And, and I say a lot, like some of the best guys I've worked with are no longer in the business, you know? And, and I think about those guys, not every day, that would be cliche to say, but like most days I do think of those guys and think like, I almost owe it to them, you know, to, to do a good job because I'm getting the chance that they didn't or had to give up on for family reasons or life reasons or just got fed up with it. So I think it's just that, just that challenge of kind of maintaining and, and plugging along. Great, great, great answer right there. I like that. Um, like you just said, you said something about being a head coach. And, I mean, I would have thought that 17 years ago, you'd be running your program. I, I, you could see it then. I just thought you had it. Um, but do you ever find there are things about you that people misunderstand? Like, you know, what are they, if, if it is? Well, I think for me, you know, I, I, I have felt this for a long time. Like, I'm not a big self-promotion guy. Like, I, and it's, to be honest with you, it's probably one of the things that has held me back, uh, that I'm not great with that. But I always say, like, I'd rather, I'd rather be able to go back to you, the other guys at Central, the guys I worked with at Manhattan, the guys I worked with at Niagara, at Delaware, at the 87ers, at St. Joe's, now at Bryant. Like, I want their respect. Like, that's what I want. Like, I want to be able to earn their trust and their respect because I, I've been really fortunate. I have a last name that has helped me in the business, but at the same time, it's held me back. You know, I think there's people that look at you and think like, oh, well, you're just in this because your dad's in this. No, I'm in this because I love to do this. And I'm going to work really hard at that and make sure that, and I've always been very conscious of who my father is my name, my family, all that. Even as a young kid, I was very conscious of that. Um, and making sure that like, no one can say like, I have friends that will joke with me like, oh, you got the college basketball silver spoon, you know, like you got that. Like, and I always, it's funny, you know, we joke amongst it in our group, but like, I wanna make sure that that's not a real thing because it could be, you know, it could, you could easily be like, ah, well, you know, my dad will take care of it or this will take, you know, whatever, whoever you are, you know. And I've worked, tried to work really hard to make sure that no one that I've worked with could ever say that about me. If somebody that doesn't know me says that about me, I can't do anything about that. But the guys that I've worked with could say, no, he's in there every day. He's working as hard as anybody. He's putting in the time. He's doing what he's got to do and doing everything necessary to make sure the program, you know, and, and the staff is first. I can attest to that because if I didn't know Martella was your last name, I would never have known anything about that. So I know for two years you worked your butt off, and I, I think you worked. You got yourself to a to a spot. Like I just think people don't understand. What I know is how hard you work, how much time you put in, how much passion you have. I know all those things firsthand, so I, no, I, I can definitely that. attest to all of that. No, I um, it. so I, we always we look at stuff and we say we're educators. I mean, we're, we're coaches, but like you also educating guys all the time and. A lot of times, I always say this, that when kids come to campus, you know, you, you're like, your job is kind of like take them from being a young boy to a man. Their parents did a great job. Now it's your job to kind of like, oh, these are the things that are going to help you for the rest of your life. These are the most four or five, four or five most important years of your life that you're going to develop these times. Um, what would you try to teach your players besides basketball? I mean, be a good person, you know, be a good person. And obviously that encompasses a lot. Um, you know, I think that, like just understanding that, that there's, there's a huge world out there, you know, for them, that there's opportunities for them. I mean, you know, I go back a lot to the guys that, that you know, I've coached, that we've coached, you know, any of us that, they come in a certain way, you know, Kashif Edwards, who I mentioned, was from North Philadelphia, went to Imhotep Charter. You know, he was, he was not the greatest student in the world, but he had a work ethic. 
He had been taught really, really well. He'd been prepared really, really well at Imhotep. Uh, Andre Noble is a good friend of mine. Like he, they, they trained him to be able to go to college. So although he might not have had some of the, the certain skills that maybe the kid that came from the, the rich private school may have gotten, Kashif had a work ethic. He had a desire. So you look at a kid, you know, I look at a kid like that, that, you know, he would sit at that screen and you'd be like, I don't know if he knows what he's going to put on this paper right now to now today, you know, six months ago or so I get a, a, a thing that, you know, he was named like he was in some article, like one of the top 30 under 30 black entrepreneurs in whatever, you know, and he's doing this stuff. And I reached out to him like, this, like you have no idea because I'll be honest with you. And, and I think a lot of us, we probably don't say this much, but a lot of us probably do have this feeling. Like there are times in this where I wonder, like, am I doing enough good? You know, like you get caught up in the wins and losses, the coaching and all that, which I love. But I also look at myself and think like, okay, you have, you have to have a higher purpose. So I wonder that sometimes. And it's those stories. It's getting those messages. Uh, Demetrius Williamson, who I coached at Niagara too, like, you know, he sent me a thing that he's doing um, recently, you know, that he started this company and things like that. And you just, like, you look at that and you go like, man, like, I don't know what part I played, but I hope I played some part in that, some small part, some little piece of that, uh, you know, getting invited to a guy's wedding or, you know, a guy calling you telling you had a baby and like the, to hear him growing in his life uh, and understanding. And obviously with everything that's going on in our world today, you know, to be able to get that education, that free education, you know, and have those guys that like, you know, that are like, dude, I would have never been in college. Like there's no chance I would have been able to go to college if I hadn't been able to play basketball and get a scholarship. So it does kind of bring you back to, okay, this is why I'm doing what I'm doing. And, and I don't know if I'm answering your question, but, but that's kind of the, I think it's just helping them figure that out so that at some point in time, they can be great in their professional life, whether that's basketball or outside of basketball, when they can be great, you know, in their, their family relationships as a father, as a husband, uh, you know, those are the things that I get great satisfaction in. Definitely, definitely answer the question. I mean, everything you just talked about, it's just all life lessons. Like yeah. as you're just talking through stuff, things that you've gone through as an adult. So right. that's still, you get, you're still educating them more. And, and I think that's a big thing, like for them to understand that, cause watch, like they look at all of us and go like, you coach basketball and they all think we make a million dollars and they all think this and they think that like, no, like I've got real things too. You know what I mean? Like, like I still have to go home and figure out a way to pay bills when I'm working a hundred hours a week and I'm not getting paid like someone who works a hundred, you know, like I've, I'm doing that. Like I'm got to figure that out. You know, like I was making $30,000 at Niagara with a wife and a baby and she wasn't working, you know, and you're trying to figure out like, how, how are we making this work? You know? And, and you're laughing cause those guys think like, Oh, you got it made cause you got a car and you got an apartment and you got a wife and you got a kid. Like, no, nah, like <laughs> that's just the beginning, you know, of trying to figure this thing out. So I think letting them know that and then being there and letting them know that like, I am here, I'm here for you, you know? And, and again, there's guys that I talk to probably more now than I did when they were players, you know, for me, you know, or, or for our team or whatever, like just because of whatever, you know, you've connected and they're doing whatever they're doing. And you're like, Hey, what can I do to help you? Like, what can I do to help you? Cause the reality is all those players help us in some way. They all help us in some way. They help us win. They help us do all those things, you know, and, and somehow, some way, you got to be able to help them in return. Totally agree with you. I totally agree with you. Now, you've, like like I said, you've won and won, been to the NCAA tournament, uh, player as, and a coach, but, like, what are your best and worst memories in coaching? The best are the, the winning those championships and those selection Sundays. I mean, that was – you know, those were, were all time highs. Uh, we, we were in the, I think it was the last single playing game in 2007 when we won a championship at Niagara. We somehow, we shouldn't, we should have been like a 14 seed or a 13 seed, to be honest with you. Uh, we got, we were shocked they got, they put us in the, the playing game. Uh, winning that game, like the thrill of that was, was exhilarating. Um, and even at being a player and winning games in the NSA tournament, it wasn't the same as a coach. 
because the, the adrenaline of like Saturday night, you find out you're playing on Tuesday night in Dayton, playing Florida A&M, trying to get there, get there, trying to get prepared to play the game, play the game and win. And now you're like, now we're going to Chicago to play Kansas. You know, like that, that was a, a major rush. Uh, Selection Sunday, like I said, is always, uh, you know, always a high. I think some of the disappointments that at the moment felt like crushing blows. Um, but in hindsight, you kind of see some things and go like, man, it kind of worked out. You know, I, I really wanted, when I was at Niagara, I wanted to go to, uh, Sean Carney got the Holy Cross job and I had known Sean a long time and thought I was going, like I thought I was in with him. And um, I remember sitting at Hoop Group and he was like, hey, you got, you got a minute to talk. And then we walked and sat, found some bench and sat down. And he essentially told me he wasn't hiring me. And I was devastated. You know, I was devastated. I was 27 years old. You know, Megan was back in Bristol still. We were still dating. She was in Bristol. And, you know, I was like an hour away. It was like perfect. You know, everything was perfect. Guy that I've known my whole life, that I love, I respect. Um, a place like Holy Cross. And 10 months later, he gets fired. You know, and you're like, man, if I'd been there and not been at Niagara and who knows, you know, who knows? So, um, you know, so those are probably some of the disappointments, but like I said, as we said earlier, there's, there's so many twists and turns in this. Some of those disappointments actually turn out to be a good thing, you know, in hindsight. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Um, I'm going to ask you this. Cause like people still don't, it's, it's this business is this way and it could be the smallest of things that does it. But like, what was the most stressful situation you have faced? Um, probably when I was at Niagara, we played Liberty in the bracket buster. Um, so we played Liberty in the bracket buster. I was doing travel and Lynchburg is not the most glamorous place in the world. You know, no disrespect to anybody that is from there or loves it there. So I'm trying to get it, you know, get us set up to go down there. And we had a hotel set up. I forget what it was. And maybe like two weeks before the guy calls me, he's like, Hey, we, had, we don't have enough rooms at whatever hotel it was, you know, Lamar's Hotel. But we have a sister property that we can put you in. You know, it'd be all the same, da, da, da. So no problem. So we end up going to the Days Inn in Lynchburg. We got there, and, I mean, it was awful. It was absolutely awful. And then to top it off, they put us, you know, everyone gets a meeting room. Our meeting room was like in a Denny's in, across the parking lot the TV was like on a booth table. There was no way we could watch it. I remember we ended up going to my room and setting it up in the room, in the little days in room. We had, you know, 15, 18 people in there trying to watch film. So Mahalik was pissed to begin with. We go down there, we lose the game. He gets thrown out. That was just like, that's one of those you still, I still talk about to this day of like, and that guy, I remember calling that guy going like, you set me up. Like that was so wrong what you did. Like, I mean, that hotel was awful. Like, it was one of those places you're like, I, I can't believe I'm staying here. Like, you wanted to wear a hazmat suit walking in there. Um, so that that was pretty stressful um, as far as that. Uh, and I and on top of that, like, non-specific, like, I've worked for some guys that, you know, most days were stressful. You know, working for Bobby Gonzalez, most people know the stories now. Like, they were stressed. Like, I, I, we, we had those old Nextel phones. And I remember his number was restricted and it was the only number that would call restricted and it had a certain ringtone. And I swear to God, if I heard that ringtone right now, I'd get a pit in my stomach, you know? Wow. And, and, um, and I love Bobby. Like I actually saw him a couple months ago and, and all that, but you know, that time working for him, that, that was hard. And when that number would come up and it would show restricted and you'd hear that ringtone, I'm telling you every, every time. And if I heard it right now, that's no lie. I would get that pit in my stomach and it's been whatever it's been, 15 years. Wow. <laughs> Bobby Gonzalez. Now this is going to, this is kind of go, you're probably going to laugh because you might have something. Could be funny, could be serious, but like, what is the strangest thing a player has done outside of the basketball court? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, we had <laughs> – that's a pretty good one. We had a player miss his senior day 
and I won't say, I'm not going to say who it was or where it was, uh, but he, he, he was shaving, but he wasn't shaving his face. He was shaving a certain area and he somehow got an infection and he spent senior day, he was in the hospital. He missed that, that weekend's games and missed senior day because he was in the hospital with an infection in a certain area. So that's going to be the strangest. I love hearing those type of stories. That's, yeah, that, that was an all-timer. That player also had a – this was before I got there, but that player also had a girl show up in the office requesting half of his gear because she was – she claimed they were married and she was entitled to half of all of his stuff. So I don't know if she wanted, like, he can keep the right sneaker, but I get the left sneaker. Like, I don't know what she wanted exactly, but, yeah, there were some, there were some interesting ones with that. Wow. He was, so, a really, he was really good, though. He was, he was really good. Wow. That's, that's pretty good. Um, uh, like I said, you've been in for a while. You've worked for some good guys. And like I said, I think you're um, – you're, 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 you've, been, you've been in the game for a while now. So, like, I think you, your next step is being a head coach. That's, that's, what, I, that's what I believe. Um, and so I'm going to ask basically from a – you know enough ADs now and stuff, or even if it's going to the highest level. But if you had a chance to work for anyone in college basketball, like who would that be and why? Now, it could be an AD or a head coach. You're going like, you know, and it might not even be just one particular person, but it's some guys I know you worked for your dad for a year. So, yep. um, but like anyone else um, that you could think of? I mean, that's a really, really, really good question. Um, there's probably a, a decent sized list of those guys. Um, and, and a lot of it is probably just perception, right? Like you don't really know the ins and outs of, of guys and their programs and all that. Uh, you know, a guy like Tom Izzo comes to mind, you know, just, just with the, the success he's had and, you know, from the outside looking in the way it looks like he runs his program. Um, you know, I, I, that one pops up. Um, you know, NBA wise, like a Brad Stevens, you know, somebody like that that kind of, um, you know, somebody that you kind of watch and, and for me, kind of admire his uh, the way he he kind of goes and, and the things that he does. Um, Doc Rivers would be somebody like I think Doc is you know, like he's just somebody that kind of look at and be like, man, like I, I would just feel like you could learn so much from a guy like that. Um, you know, so those are guys that, that kind of pop into mind. Uh, AD wise, Ed McLaughlin is the AD at VCU who was our AD at Niagara is one of my guys. Like I, I love Ed to death. I, I would give any, you know, anything to, you know, have a chance to work with him again. Um, you know, and, and, I think for me, the best piece of advice I ever got from my dad before I started coaching was just go work for good people. You know, so anybody that is considered a quote unquote good person. And again, that doesn't mean that there's not stressful moments. You know what I mean? And, and you know, I'm really lucky right now to be working with one of, my, one of my closest friends. You know, me and Jared have been super tight from, you know, those days when we met, you know, working, working hoop group camp. Um, you know, so to have that opportunity to work with somebody that, you know, for me, like everybody I've worked for, it has not always been easy. You know, there've been those ups and downs, those stresses, but for the most part, they've all been really, really good people. You know, and at the end of the day, yes, you can have your disagreements. Maybe I don't like the way we're, you know, we're, we're doing something in practice or the way we're doing something with our guys or, you know, whatever, you know, you might not like the, every kid you recruit, but I think when you can go back and lay your head down and no, okay, like I'm working with somebody, like I, I'm going to enjoy working with that person more days than not, you know, and, and at the flip, like I work for some guys that, you know, I say it all the time, like they added stress to an already stressful situation, you know, and, and that makes it really, really hard. So, you know, there are, for me, like I'll go work for anybody that's a decent person, you know, that would have your best interest at heart. That's not a, you know, 
not going to lie to you and, you know, treat you like dirt and going to treat you like a professional, especially at this stage. Like, you know how it is. Like when you've been in it this long, you kind of feel like, all right, like, you know, you're somewhat established and, and, you know, I know how to work. Like I, you know, and it doesn't mean things don't get screwed up sometimes, but like, I'm sitting here working just as much as you are, you know? And, and so to be treated like a kid that doesn't know what he's doing. And I hear those stories from guys and you're like, damn, like you've been in this a long time and you're still getting that, you know, like to me that that's, I couldn't do that. So anybody that doesn't fall into that, I could go work for and be somebody I'd want to work for. That, that, I mean, that I totally agree with you. And, and I, I'm going to steal something from your dad because I heard him say it before. Like at this point you should be, working with someone and not working for someone. And I've heard your dad say that plenty of times, like guys don't work for him. They work with him. And that's what it should be. Like you, like you, we've been in this, we've been in this for more than, you know, 15, 16, 17 years. Like, no, you should be working with a guy now and not, you know, feeling like you're always working for him. Um, now you kind of answered a little bit earlier. So I'm going to ask, come back and just ask, but like, what's the biggest accomplishment like you have experienced since, um, being in college, being in college coaching. I mean, not to be corny about it, but I, I think I've done a good job balancing being a coach, being a father and being a husband, you know, and that maybe it sounds like a line, maybe it sounds kind of corny, but like, I, I'm super proud of that. You know, I'm proud that my kids are excited to come to games. I'm proud that my son is like all into it and wants to be around and wants to, you know, like I'm, I'm very proud of that. Um, because like, that's the way I grew up, you know, and I wasn't pushed into it and he wasn't pushed into it. And the littlest one, he seems to be on the same path because all he wants to do is shoot the ball, shoot the ball, shoot the ball. Um, so I think being able to do that, um, that would probably be number one, you know, certainly obviously the wins and the, the championships and being able to have those moments, you're always proud of that stuff. Um, you know, proud, like we said, about guys kind of growing up, watching guys grow up and become men and have them call you and tell you they're having a baby and, you know, they're getting married or they got a house or they, you know, started a company. Like those things, you know, that kind of, for me, like I said, that kind of puts me back on when I start to stray and go like those stressful moments and you're like, am I doing enough good in my life? And then you get that and you're like, all right, that brings me back. Like, that's what I need. Awesome. Um, and I'm a, this is not corny and that your answer definitely wasn't corny. I think that's a uh, terrific answer. Like you were saying, maybe it is, but this may be a little bit cause it kind of going to throw you off, but like what movie or TV show title best describes your week? Oof. TV show, man. Um, <laughs> That's a good question. On a normal week, uh, let's say Sports Center because it's I'm on a normal. If I'm around and I'm not traveling, or whatever, and I'm in the office and we're doing workouts and practice, and then you know most of the time I'm leaving there and I'm going to, you know, Phillips got AU basketball practice or Little League game or Mara's got soccer or. Uh, you know, I'm going home and I'm watching, you know, my brother Jimmy's VCU team or my dad's Michigan team or so I'm going to I'm going to go. It's kind of been taking an easy way out, but I'm going to go sports center because uh, it seems like it seems like that's where our life up until the last three months is always uh, revolving around. That's a good that's a good answer. I mean, that's that's what it is. That's what it is. Um. You've been in it for a long time. We we worked for a guy who had the biggest phrases or words, but like, what's your favorite word or phrase? We worked for Howard Dickman. You know, he had the, he was the king of it. But yeah, what's your he favorite? Have, he did have a million of them for sure. Um, I'll give you my favorite quote. I'll give you my favorite quote. Uh, a goal without a plan is just a wish. I heard Herm Edwards say that on TV one time when he was doing ESPN, the, the football coach, Herm Edwards. He was working on ESPN, and I heard him say that on ESPN. 
And I looked it up. It's some like French poet, like one of those old, you couldn't even pronounce the name. Anytime I talk to anybody, that's what I use. Cause I think that's so, it's, it's like unbelievably powerful to me. A goal without a plan is just a wish because the reality is like how many times have we done that exercise with our players or with ourselves and go like, what's your goal? Write down your goals for the season. And then it's just there. Yeah. We want, we want to win a championship. Yeah. 11 teams in our league. That's their goal is to win a championship. But like, what's your plan to get there? You know? And, and so I think for me, that's kind of always one. I use that with our guys sometimes, like, you know, what, what's your plan? Like, you know, and, and, all right, like this is what you want to do, but what is your, what's your path to get there? You know, it's not just, Hey, I want to do this. Okay, great. You know, I, I could say it all the time. Like I want to win, win a million dollars in the lottery. Well, if I don't have a plan to play the lottery every day, then, you know, like I'm not, win they're not just calling me up today and going, Hey, Phil, uh, we heard you're a good guy. We're going to give you a million dollars. Congrats. You won the lottery. Like, no, it doesn't work that way. So yeah, a goal without a plan is just a wish. That's, that's good, good to go by. Um, what would you say? Where is your happy place? Some people uh, have the reason why I say that because, like, I'm a guy who like when stuff just not going right. I'm at work. I might leave and for an hour or two and go to the movie theater and like that's third possession. Like you know what I'm saying? So like what anything that's come to you? Like some people say weight room or some people say the court, but like what, where is your happy place? Um. I mean, being home with my family, you know, like that's an, that's an easy one. Uh, my parents have a house down the Jersey shore in Avalon, New Jersey, which is like the greatest place on earth to all of us. So, you know, that's probably like the closest I can get to like a specific location, you know, being there, there's just something about being there that, uh, you know, it's just, it's always nice. It's always enjoyable. Um, but yeah, I'm not like a, like, I don't really golf. Like I don't really, you know, I kind of go to the office, I go home, you know, I go to the office, watching my kids perform, like watching them perform, you know, whatever it is, uh, whether it's my daughter doing ballet or Philip playing basketball or playing, you know, baseball or both of them playing soccer. Um, that brings me a lot of joy. Like I never realized that as a kid, you don't realize that, but like now being a father, like watching them kind of enjoy themselves and kind of go through and, kind of bring back your old memories of that, you know, playing little league and things like that. Like that, that's probably, uh, you know, a good one for me too. Um, if you had to choose three adjectives to describe yourself, which would you choose? Uh, organized, hardworking, uh, resilient. I've been trying to – those are three good ones, and I'm a, I'm trying to pull this one out. And it's not going to happen because I think your dad is still there, but, you know, I, I love your mom. But what person and or event has had the most influence on your life? Oof. And I know your grandfather was always close to you, so I you know. So which one you – which what, what person or event? It could be a, it could be more than just one. It don't have to be – yeah. Um, well, I think event wise, um, Megan walking into that, into Dietrich gym on that morning of basketball camp at central Connecticut in June of 2004, uh, that obviously has impacted my life tremendously, uh, over the last 16 years. So that would be a, that would be a major one. Um, getting fired at Delaware that that had a major impact in a lot of different ways for me. Um, and I always say this, like going through that and, and I'm sure a lot of people that will watch this have probably been through it. Uh, and if you haven't, you're lucky. And everybody says that and you don't know it till you go through it. You know, I had been in the business for a long time and hadn't gone through it. And, and you know, we were coming off of winning the championship and things got real ugly and, um, looked like we had gotten through that. And then all of a sudden, you know, Monte called me. I just dropped my daughter off at preschool. I was getting ready to head down there. And uh, I was sitting in the parking lot. He called me. So having to go home and walk back into that house and tell Megan, like, yeah, we just got fired. Like, I, I, and really, like, they just fired him. And we don't know what our fate is. 
so going through that like has made me a better friend. It's made me a better colleague in the business um, because there are people that you go through that and there are people that have had a profound impact on me the way that they reached out and reached back and connected and made sure that I was okay. And the flip is there's, there were people that I thought were close that didn't. And it makes you realize like, okay, on one end, it makes you realize how good the business is and how good the people are. On the other, it makes you realize how cutthroat it is, you know, because maybe those guys had their own motives there uh, that you realize in time. So I would say that, I mean, that, that as a professional, meeting Megan as just overall and as a person, but as a professional, getting fired and going through that, um, because I'd never seen that, you know what I mean? Like, I'd never really seen my dad go through it. Like, there was two changes while he was at St. Joe's as an assistant. But I was young, and I didn't, wouldn't have known. And I never had gone through it as a, as, as a coach. So to go through that, you, you realize quick. Like, you realize quick who your friends are. You know, you realize quick what matters and what doesn't matter. Um, you know, so that, that probably had the biggest impact. So true, man. You're right. Like, then you see, like, who, like you said, I, I like when you said, like, now you see who your true friends are when things happen like that. Um, I'm, and I'm going to end it with this question a little bit, and it's I always ask this because you, like, you've been in it for a long time now, but knowing what you know now, like, what would you tell your young self to prepare for as an assistant coach? Um, I, I think especially when you're first getting into the business, like, be ready to work and be ready for the unpredictable nature of this thing. Um, and, and I'll tell you what, like I always say, like, and I, I wish I had realized this at the time, like I, like I came into this, like I had lived a fairy tale, you know what I mean? Like my dad was a long time assistant, 10 years as an assistant, gets the head job. His first year, they go to the NIT championship. His second year, they go to the sweet 16 have a couple down years, then Jameer comes and we go back to whatever. And, you know, he goes from running out of gas once a week because he didn't have enough money to put in the tank to making more than enough money to, you know, provide for his family and for his kids and his grandkids and all that. So that's a fairy tale in this, you know, and, and, um, and I always say like longevity in this thing, and, and I don't know if other people would agree or not, but longevity in this thing is about how much crap you can deal with and keep going back and keep going. That's why I use that word resilient. You know, like, I don't think you can last in this without a strong level of resilience because you're going to be faced with something, if not daily, weekly, monthly, that's going to make you go like, all right, like, can I do this anymore? You know, like, when your wife is telling you, like, I, you know, I don't know, you know, our credit card bills going through the roof. Like what, what do you do? Like what, you know, cause there's not enough coming in to pay everything. You know, like when you have a, a, a family and a small salary and things like that, when you're starting it, like those things, it does, it makes you go like, all right, like, can I keep going? All right. Do I want to uproot my family and move them to whatever part, part of the country, you know, that, that no one else would probably ever go to for any reason. And you're going, yeah, but there's an assistant job at whatever school. Um, so I would, I would say that, like, you, you better be ready, you know, to be resilient. And, and to understand that you were coming from one place. Like, I had seen one place. And I got to Central, and it was completely different in every which way than what I had experienced. And then you go, like, okay, well, now I'm going to Manhattan. And that's a different level of different. You know, and then you're going to Niagara and it's different. You're going to Delaware and it's different. And you're, so you're constantly adjusting, but you're constantly facing these struggles that like, all right, like you, can you deal with it? And it's okay if you can, you know, it's okay if you can. Like if we went back in time to that time where we're talking about in my younger self and we went around hoop group camp and all those guys that we worked hoop group camp with starting out that all had these visions, they were all going to be, Rick Pitino or John Calipari or Bill Self or Roy Williams or Dean Smith, whoever they were going to be, that now you're like, man, what was that guy's name? Remember that guy that worked camp? And what was, oh, man, like, what's he doing now? You know, so 
at that time you all think like, yeah, we're all right. I'm going to go to central Connecticut and then I'm going to go do this. And I'm going to be an assistant here and I'm going to be the head coach at wherever. And then I'm going to do this and do that. The other thing I would say is that there's a lot of really good places. Again, like I would grown up around one place. Um, and I always thought like, that's where I wanted to get back to. And then you realize after a while, like now, nah, like, there's, there's a lot of really good people and there's a lot of good things at Central Connecticut. There's a lot of good people and a lot of good things at Manhattan. A lot of good things and good people at Niagara and Delaware and now Bryant and all these places in between that you're like, okay, like you can carve out a niche somewhere else and it's okay. That's awesome, man. Like, yeah, I, I, I appreciate all the, all the gems you dropped. Um, and so I want to thank you again for being a guest on the show and being unmasked. Um, anything you just want to say before we, you know, get log off? Say no, I mean, I, I, I appreciate you. You know, I appreciate your friendship through all these years. And, you know, you didn't have to let me live with you 16 years ago, and you did. And who knows where I would have lived otherwise. But, uh, you know, that friendship and that bond, you know, kind of you said it in the beginning, uh, you know, that means the world. Because in the world we're in today, you know, for for a guy with my background coming from where I come from, a guy with your background coming from where you came from, to kind of meet in this thing and become friends. And it, in some way, it gives me hope for the rest of the world. You know what I mean? And in a time where I struggle with optimism with, with everything you see going on and, you know, the, the, the stuff that you know needs to change and you hope changes and you hope that, you know, with, with uh, the protests and people speaking up and finally you know, people getting it, you know, or at least seemingly starting to get it. Um, I get hope in that, you know, I get hope in, in watching, you know, those relationships like you and I kind of grow and, and become friends and become brothers and become all those things. And, you know, you hope that uh, you can see that from, from the people around you. So, you know, I appreciate your friendship. I appreciate, you know, all these years of, you know, the, the talks and the help and the, you know, you got any play calls on this team and you got, uh, what do you think about this player and how's Sandy and how's Megan and how's everything, you know, th that, um, you know, it's something I really appreciate. So, so thanks. Yeah, for having man, me. me too, man. Like I, you know, like I can remember when Elizabeth was in high school and Jimmy <laughs> and I felt like I was part of the Martelli family, yep. you know, it was, it was interesting. And, and so, yeah, I mean, that, that was great, man. The M&M yeah. pretzels. My mom, my mom would make these M&M pretzels and you didn't tell that story. She'd send God, these, she'd make these M&M pretzels. She'd send them up, and before you know it, they'd be gone. I'm like that. <laughs> we'll talk about that another time. But uh, <laughs> thanks again. Uh, thank you, viewers, for watching another great show. Uh, stay tuned for the next guest as we get a, get them unmasked. See you next time and stay safe. <laughs>